Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is time once again for the Centennial Lunch and Learn History Series. Uh, I'm Karen Thomas, I'm the Bloomberg School Historian, and we have these every month, um, and the next one is on January 21st. It's gonna be about the history of computing and technology at the school, so I hope you can come to that. Um, so today's talk is, should be a lot of fun, and if you see something as we're going through that you want me to go back to later, kind of make a mental note of it or write it down or whatever, um, this should be pretty interactive, and if you have any questions, um, if you can hold them to the end, but I can always go back to the slide if you want to look at it. So today's talk is about the Master of Public Health degree and also the overall curriculum at the school. And then finally, how student life changed at the school over the course of the 20th century. So I wanna ask about, um, I, mean, I think we think of the MPH as the standard degree for public health, kind of the gateway to a career in public health, but it hasn't always been that way and I want to explain why the MPH really became the flagship degree for the school and how Johns Hopkins contributed to the development of the MPH nationwide. Uh, our curriculum changed significantly. What students were learning back in 1920 was very, very different <laughs> from what they're learning today. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I wanted to just take a look at what the overall student body was like over time, and you can kind of break it down into three different periods. Until 1981, the student body was majority male. Uh, now, we have always had women students from the very beginning, uh, but in 1981, our student body became majority female, and has been ever since, and increasingly so. Uh, Throughout the school's history, we have had a um, higher proportion of foreign students than most other schools of public health. And in the beginning, with the Rockefeller Foundation funding a lot of uh, fellowships, we had about 20% uh, foreign students. But in this middle uh, period of the 20th century, it goes up because of the creation of the World Health Organization, USAID, um, and the Cold War was making international health a really important part of foreign policy. So we were bringing people from other countries to come study here, and then we were sending people out from the United States to other countries as well. So that really picks up. And then some of the, the funding goes down in the later part of the 20th century, so we get a bit of a scaling back there. The age of the students also starts at around 35 because people were really mid-career professionals with some experience under the, their belt already. But as you go forward into the 1980s, uh, there is a much broader disciplinary diversity. So mostly physicians in the beginning, but broadens to include nurses, social scientists, statisticians, lawyers, computer sciences, scientists, uh, but in the beginning, it was very much focused on the physicians. And finally, you know, we all are concerned about funding. Um, I know I am. And so in the early days, our entire school was funded by pretty much a single funder and the interest from the endowment that the Rockefeller Foundation gave us. And we also had uh, most of our students came on Rockefeller Foundation fellowships plus tuition was only $250 a year. So uh, then in the middle uh, 20th century, we really get a dramatic increase in federal training grants. And also there's federal legislation that gives direct scholarship aid. And then in the last couple of decades, uh, we have gone into a period where more students are taking out loans to come here, and tuition, of course, has dr risen dramatically. So one of the, I think, one of the neatest like things you can hold in your hands and touch about the history of the school is these student ID booklets, the student directories, and there was one of these for every single 
faculty member in the school and they had all of the students' names and pictures in them and a little bit of information about them, like where they were from, what their previous degrees were, what they were studying, and also what their funding source was. So these are some of the students from those directories uh, back in the 1940s and 50s. So just to point out a couple of things, um, this is David Bodian and Isabel Morgan, who were very highly trained, brilliant scientists, but they didn't have a background in epidemiology, and they were actually in the Department of Epidemiology. They were trained as biologists, uh, so they took some courses in epidemiology, and that's why they have a student photo. Um, and this is Reginald James, the first African-American graduate of the school, who was a, who was a uh, public health service officer, and he's wearing his uniform because he graduated in 1946. Uh, this is Paul Harper, the first chair of maternal and child health and also later population dynamics, which is today our Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health, was a student here. Um, this is Tim Baker, who some of you may know. Um, he's really a very handsome student, don't you think? Um, uh, this is Sushila Nayar, um, who is Mahatma Gandhi's physician and came over very shortly after India gained its independence and uh, came on a, um, I think on a United Nations fellowship uh, to the school. And she goes on to become the Minister of Health of India. So these are, this is just a, a kind of a fun thing that gives you a little bit of a feel for the students, how they dressed, um, how young some of them were. So before 1935, schools of public health were very different than uh, they are today. They really stressed research over practice. Most of them were private universities funded by either the Rockefeller Foundation or other uh, philanthropies. Doctoral students were the majority. And there were some schools that were more geared toward training frontline pu public health professionals but especially here at Johns Hopkins, Harvard, uh, University of Toronto, we were very geared toward training top level physician administrators and highly trained research scientists. So we had a, a majority of doctoral students at that time. There were relatively few field training sites and I've run across a lot of comments in, in the archives about um, some of the lectures early on were a little boring and, and a little stale. Uh, but, you know, so you have the, the students uh, here in the bacteriology lab, and, you know, they're in a really large room at different tables. Um, so that would be a, a typical group setting. Um, and you'll see as we go later on, the, the lab setup uh, gets, there's fewer people, and the equipment is much more high tech as you go forward in time. Uh, you can't really see the writing on this picture very well, but this group is the first student group founded at the school. It's the Ubiquiteers. And they are, uh, we actually got more Rockefeller money to found the Ubiquiteers, which I think is really great. It was, it was strictly a social club for the students here, and they, the Rockefeller Foundation thought that was important enough that they, uh, they helped us found it. Um, so, I would say that, you know, to sum this up, we were really looking at quality over quantity. We were, all of the schools, there were about eight schools before World War II, and they were only putting out about a little over 100 graduates a year. I mean, it was tiny. So that's what schools of public health used to be like. And, you know, we were, the other schools were turning out uh, master's degrees, but not as many as doctoral degrees. And the, the Harvard actually had the first degree called a Master of Public Health, but you know, there were one year master's level degrees at the different schools and they were called different things. And actually here at Hopkins, it was called the Certificate of Public Health. So if you look up here, we have from the very first school catalog, the course leading to a certificate in public health, but it was the same as the MPH at Harvard. So how do we get the, the MPH that we know today, the modern MPH, 
that's the gateway to being a public health professional. There are really two major figures that were very involved in the 1930s and 40s in creating the MPH and, and standardizing it uh, so that there would be consistent quality standards throughout all the schools of public health. So the man on the left who I've talked about before is Thomas Perrin, who served as Surgeon General of the US Public Health Service from uh, 1936 to 1948. And Lowell Reed was Dean of uh, the School of Public Health uh, at almost the same time that Perrin was Surgeon General. So he was Dean from 37 to 46. And Reed was a biostatistician and he was a fantastic teacher. And I love this quote from one of his students in the 1940s. Uh, she said, he was the, one of the most brilliant teachers I ever had. And I learned that just as x-rays permitted us to see what's going on inside the human body, statistics enabled me to see what's going on in a population. So that's a great analogy. So Reed and Perrin were on the scientific board of the Rockefeller Foundation. They were on the leadership boards of the American Public Health Association. Um, so the, the leadership of public health is just a very small club during this time in history. Um, so everybody knew each other. And so Perrin and other leaders within, you know, other leaders at other schools, I'm not trying to say that Hopkins was the only one doing anything, uh, but the first real standardization of public health education is when the American Public Health Association creates the Committee on Professional Education in 1932. And then in 1935 is where you really get the legislation, the funding, and the political support to make the MPH a national degree to, and it is a policy objective of the federal government to train a national force of, of health professionals. And that is not the case before 1935. So 35 is a big turning point. In 1939, if any of you are a little bit familiar with medical history, you may have heard of the 1910 Flexner Report by Abraham Flexner uh, to the General Education Board of the Rockefeller Foundation. And that report sets the standards for medical education uh, and ends the, what were called diploma mills. Uh, so that's kind of the, um, the gold standard in medical education. And so in 1939, Perrin and a man named Livingston Ferrand, who's a, a public health prof uh, reformer and was also, I think, president of, uh, I don't remember what, I, Columbia, anyway, he was a, a high level educator who was also a public health reformer. But even though it's called the perrin Ferrand Report, a lot of Lowell Reed's ideas were definitely uh, in the report as well. Um, and Lowell Reed becomes the, the founding president who convenes the other deans of public health around the nation to found the Association of Schools of Public Health which is recently changed to stain to the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health. So, um, so we're really seeing the beginnings of a national movement to standardize and improve the quality of professional education in public health and dramatically increase the number of graduates. So expanding the existing schools, founding new schools. So as, as a very important part of all this, you've got to have a curriculum. What are you going to teach these people? What is the most important thing you need to know in order to be a public health officer? So uh, it's, it's not until 1946 that schools of public health are accredited, um, and we are accredited in 1946, thank goodness. Um, and then another key point that's a little further forward is when the CDC sets up the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Uh, it is founded by a man named Alexander Langmuir, who's both an alum of the school and was on the epidemiology faculty before he went to the CDC. But the EIS, um, there were lots of schools turning out graduates, 
But the EIS becomes one of the primary trainers of epidemiologists in the United States. So it, it uh, over the next several decades, is going to put out several thousand epidemiologists. And so the EIS is more like a residency or a, an apprenticeship type training, on the job training. Um, but when Langmuir created the first training course, which I believe was a two year course uh, in 1951, he tapped three faculty members here at the school to teach the first course. So that was Abe Lillianfeld, um, who later becomes chair of epidemiology here, uh, Philip Sartwell, who is the current chair of epidemiology, and oh, John Hume, John Hume, who later becomes dean. So you know, we're, we're shaping the EIS training, and we're also shaping the MPH curriculum. And so these are the main goals of the APHA um, and the ASPH of what they wanted to do uh, with both the curriculum and uh, creating the MPH, and also you know, working toward having a, a fully professional uh, workforce in public health. So this is, like I think, one of the most fun slides in the presentation. It's about field trips. So what are we teaching people here at the school? Um, one of the objectives of the Reed and Perrin reforms was to get people out of the classroom, sitting in those lectures, and get them out into the field and really seeing and experiencing what public health practice was about. Um, I got these photos from the Baltimore Sun, but they really give you an, a good idea of what the students would have gone out and seen when they were here as students. So public health, before World War II especially, was focused on what were called the basic six services. And I think I can remember them all. Uh, statistics, maternal and child health, environmental sanitation, uh, public health administration, you know, running health departments. Um, and I honestly can't remember the others, but anyway. Uh, so here is a sanitary, sanitary laboratory. So this is in the Baltimore City Health Department, and the woman is examining uh, specimens of dog brains to find out if they had rabies. So you know, they would uh, know, you know if they had a rabies outbreak on their hands or not, or if, if someone needed to be treated for rabies. Um, here is a well baby clinic. Uh, so a really important part of public health was providing prenatal and well child care and uh, you know, post, uh, postpartum care. So this is a child getting a, a DPT shot um, very nearby in Canton, in the neighborhood of Canton. Um, this is the entrance to the uh, different well baby clinic that's actually on Madison Avenue, very near the school. So that's what the entrance looked like. Um, these are sanitarians who are in an in-service training uh, course for, in the Eastern Health District. So the difference between a sanitarian and a public health officer, a sanitarian will go out and inspect restaurants, inspect uh, work sites, um, here is a sanitarian checking. Uh, people actually went out into your home and checked the tap water to make sure that the levels of bacteria were not too high. Um, and here's another person inspecting a milk plant. Um, and they would actually check the expiration dates and make sure that there wasn't any foreign material in the milk. Um, so, and actually, in the early 20th century, milk was a very common source of um, disease, and if children drank contaminated milk, uh, they could actually die from it. So it was really very important to keep the milk inspected. And a lot of uh, health departments actually had um, free milk services for the community. So that would get, so even if our students were not necessarily going to go out and be sanitarians and be, and be doing the inspections themselves, they needed to understand how a health department functioned in case they ended up being in charge of it. <laughs> um, so this was on, on site. And one of the favorite 
field experiences of generations of students was going with Anna Bacher to industrial plants. And, and they would all put on their hard hats, and we actually still have hard hats today. If you saw the objects photo essay, you know, we've got a hard, hard hat for the uh, occupational and environmental medicine residency. But Anna Bacher, who's a, a fairly uh, slight, um, slender woman, uh, but she was very athletic. She had been a figure skater. Uh, she would be charging up these like flights and flights of stairs way up high in these industrial plants, and her younger students would have a difficult time keeping up with her. But I, I would have loved to have been able to go on a, a plant visit uh, with, with Anna Bacher. So she took her students to places like uh, United Chemical and to the uh, Maryland State Board of Health um, occupational dermatoses clinics and things like that. So when we shift from this more specialized, very basic science focused um, elite form of public health education, now all of that still exists. It doesn't go away. It's just that it's no longer the majority. When, we, when the school and all schools of public health shift to have a, a much greater focus on public health administration and public health practice, uh, it changes the character of the curriculum and uh, the student bodies. Um, funding goes from being provided mainly by the Rockefeller Foundation to after 1950, the majority of funding for schools of public health is provided by state governments for state universities and the federal government. The number of MDs in these schools, the, the number, the actual number may have kind of remained steady, but their proportion in student bodies goes down. And by 1970, there's, for instance, at University of Michigan School of Public Health, there's only like 5% physicians in their whole school. Whereas uh, Johns Hopkins has always remained the school with the highest percentage of, of physicians. And schools became more interdisciplinary. Um, I interviewed Stephen Tarrett, who got his MPH here in, I think, 1977 or 78. Um, and he said he believes he was the first lawyer who came here, but he wouldn't have even gotten in. Um, Sue Baker would not have gotten in in the early days either um, because she didn't have a professional degree. She had a biology degree, but um, you know, she was not a health professional. So they were you know, welcoming a lot more diverse backgrounds of people. And the, the new schools that are established are almost all established at state universities. So that gives you a sense of how uh, schools of public health and the student bodies were changing. A very important catalyst for growth was World War II. So I told you earlier that the, um, we had a certificate, public, certificate of Public Health program uh, that was founded, I want to say, almost as an afterthought because it was founded a couple of years later than the Doctor of Public Health and the Doctor of Science degrees. Those were the two main degrees that they founded right away. Um, so in 1939, after the reforms that I mentioned earlier, we changed the name of the degree from a Certificate of Public Health to a Master of Public Health because we want to emphasize the graduate rigor of the degree. And that's in some ways a marketing uh, ploy because um, there were so many schools of public health starting up and a lot of them were um, really not doing graduate level training, and that was fine because uh, like the largest producers of public health degrees were actually schools of nursing. And uh, there were a lot of you know, bachelor's degrees that focused in public health nursing, and they're the largest occupational group in public health, and we needed lots of nurses. However, um, Hopkins and Harvard and the more research-oriented schools, they wanted their MPH degree to be really top class and make sure that you had a very sound uh, knowledge of biostatistics, epidemiology. Um, and I have a slide later that shows you some of the different courses that were introduced and when they were introduced, so you can kind of see how the curriculum changes. So World War II brings a lot of attention and funding to public health education because we need uh, 
public health officers and military health officers as a matter of national defense. Uh, so agencies such as the Office of Inter-American Affairs and the International Cooperation Administration, and those are the predecessors of what's now USAID, and the World Health Organization uh, was founded in 1948. Uh, those agencies require staff. And, and as national health departments and ministries are being founded around the world, they need staff. Um, and even here in the United States, uh, the US didn't really have um, fully staffed national networks of health departments serving all of the country until around 1950. Um, so there were still a lot of areas that, that really weren't covered by a, a full-time health department until then. So one of the things that the war does, it's a, it creates demand for certain specialties. And those are very much sanitary engineers, nurses, people in venereal disease control, because syphilis is a serious uh, uh, problem for the military. And the soldiers will not be able to fight effectively if they are sick with syphilis. So, um, and then finally, mental hygiene. Not only for treating people who you know, have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, although they didn't call it that then, or were you know, recovering from, from trauma during the war, but to actually screen people before they went into the military to see if they were going to be able to make it uh, in, in combat or what type of job that they ought to be placed in, things like that. So there are a lot of very practical demands for public health professionals in these different fields. Um, there was a lot of housing, you know, military-based housing, industrial plants, things like that, and that all required a sanitation infrastructure and so the demand for sanitary engineers just went way, way up during World War II. So it was really a golden age for sanitary engineering as well. So World War II and then the Cold War that follows it dramatically increases Congress's willingness to directly fund public health education and research. So it really benefits schools of public health in a lot of ways. And military officers become a large and fairly permanent group within the student population. And I had mentioned Anna Bacher before, um, a lot of the military officers uh, were taking her courses in uh, industrial hygiene, uh, military medicine, because the industrial and the military had a lot of similar needs for uh, keeping large populations healthy. Um, and she also was an expert in lung physiology. And so the military officers were taking a lot of her courses. So this photograph illustrates a lot of the themes in this slide. Um, I think it's a really cool photograph. Uh, it is of an aviation medicine Arctic lab. So let me kind of pull apart what's going on here a little bit. So these guys back here are dressed as pilots. And when the, the planes went up at high altitudes, it would be um, the, the pressure would increase and the um, temperature would drop. And there was a lot of physiological stress on the pilots. And so this uh, preventive medicine aspect, um, flight surgeons were coming in and being trained at the school uh, and learning ways to uh, protect the health of people who were in these um, very stressful environments, whether in planes or in combat. Um, and then these folks over here are, are doing, you know, are testing and collecting data on the pilots and how they're reacting in this controlled lab. So this is actually an Arctic lab. So they're, they're showing the conditions as, as they would be if you were like flying over the Arctic. Um, so we actually found uh, one of the first, there's three schools that found aviation medicine programs at the same time, and we're one of them in 1951, and that becomes a really big part of our school, and it's founded in what was then environmental medicine and is now environmental health sciences. So the specialization that really uh, 
launches the MPH, makes it grow, and is honestly the foundation for a lot of what the MPH is today, is in venereal disease control. Uh, it was established just before the war in 1938 when the National Syphilis, Syphilis Campaign was really taking off. Um, there's a National VD Control Act that gets passed in 1938, so that's helped stimulate funding. Uh, and health officers were coming, especially from the public health service, but also from a lot of state and local health departments, to come learn the techniques for effective control of syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and other um, sexually transmitted infections. So this, this specialized track actually is a third of MPH enrollment during the war. That's how popular it was. Um, and it also becomes a model for establishing other specialized training tracks within the MPH. And it's important to note here that the MPH degree at Johns Hopkins has always been a school-wide degree. So we have done that to maintain uh, consistent standards and, and high standards in our MPH program. But a lot of other schools would have department-based MPHs, so you would get an MPH in epidemiology or uh, sanitary engineering or whatever. Um, but So we had a school-wide program, but there were, you know, so you could take, you were taking the same core courses that were like half of your uh, course schedule, but then you could, basically your electives would allow you to, to have a specialization in, in one of these, uh, you know, VD control, mental hygiene, et cetera. So what really defined the MPH track and, and VD control was this unique and, and great combination of you did epidemiological field work. You were out in the streets of Baltimore in the Eastern Health District um, knocking on people's doors, doing case finding and partner no notification. Uh, and you were um, serving in the clinic and you were um, uh, observing people for, for symptoms of syphilis and learning to, to recognize uh, you know, the clinical symptoms. And then also you were doing the blood tests and examining the, the blood specimens to find out um, when people only had uh, preclinical symptoms that weren't apparent yet, you would take a blood test to find out if they had already been infected. And so the, the focus of that whole program was to treat both uh, infections that had already surfaced in clinical symptoms, but also treat preclinical syphilis as well to prevent it from spreading. And this was all like totally new and revolutionary at the time. So it was an example where clinical knowledge was actually guiding public health control measures, and it also crossed a line. We re remember when I was talking about the basic six health services you would provide basically checkups to uh, pregnant women and, and infants and, and babies, um, but you wouldn't really treat them. You wouldn't really give them medication. You could give them a vaccination, and that was about it. And there was a very strict line that the medical profession did not want uh, public health to cross. So the VD control program starts to kind of slide over that line a little bit into providing more clinical care, and that's definitely the direction that public health is going. So this is a list of all the different specialty programs that we founded within the MPH track just up through 1968. Um, so you, you kind of get a taste of the different fields that were coming online during this time. Um, so mental, mental hygiene, uh, public health psychiatrists, uh, we're learning how to prevent mental illness in populations. Um, we had the only hospital administration program in the School of Public Health. Most of them were either in hospitals or in uh, schools of business administration. So we had kind of a unique hospital administration program. Um, we had a, a program in vertebrate ecology, uh, which is the, it started during World War II as the rat control program, <laughs> and then it branched out into non-rodents and other vertebrate animals. Uh, but that was looking at the bio population biology and ecology 
And, and so you use that for zoonotic disease, but you could also look at how disease spread in populations and even how environmental hazards affected, uh, for instance, swans or penguins or seals. I am always talking about the seal tank in the basement, if you know me at all. And so that's, you know, so this specialization in vertebrate ecology is what brought a lot of these animals into the school. So that's going to be a teaser. I'm going to give a whole talk later on about um, animals in, in the school. So TB control, environmental medicine, public health nursing. That's worth noting because most of the other schools of public health had public health nursing right from the beginning, and they recognized how important that was. But we were very physician focused, and I think you know, some people really fault us for that. But in 1950, we created a division of public health nursing and really began admitting a lot more nurses. Um, public health nursing and chronic diseases kind of go together because the the introduction and the founding of chronic disease control programs and also chronic illness care programs in uh, governments, uh, it creates a, a large need for trained staff to administer these programs and to provide clinical care. Um, so if you know Edith Schoenrich, um, our uh, one of our wonderful emeriti uh, professors at the school. Um, she, even before she came to uh, earn an MPH in 1971, uh, she worked with the state health department of Maryland and was helping to run the chronic illness uh, care program that the state of Maryland was running. Uh, we, as I've mentioned in a previous talk, we had a, a program on the effects of housing on health. So that was very focused on urban and environmental health, and especially its effect on children uh, living in, uh, they looked at children living in slum conditions versus the nice, new, clean public housing at the time. Uh, and then finally, there is a a program that really deserves a lot of mention that we don't hear very often about, and that is the nurse midwifery program. So we established a, an MPH. It was actually a two-year MPH because um, the Hopkins MPH, it was nine months from the beginning until 1981, and then that's when the additional summer uh, term was added, and it became a 12-month program. Uh, but this nurse midwifery program uh, was actually a two-year program, so it was a little unusual. Our Department of Maternal and Child Health trained, if not the majority or a significant portion of the academic leadership in the field of nurse midwifery. So people around the country who were professors um, training uh, uh, nurse midwives, and this is you know, right in 1970, I can't remember exactly when Our Bodies Ourselves comes out, but this is a, a time when, uh, you know, women's health and feminism, but also um, a, a rebellion against hospital-based uh, male doctor-dominated childbirth is going on. So from a lot of really different interesting angles, we create this nurse midwifery program uh, to provide academic leadership, but also to really reform and I think humanize in a lot of ways the way uh, care was provided to both mothers uh, and newborn babies. So this gives you an idea of, so this is a list of firsts. This is when the first course that we taught in different topics, and it is not an exhaustive list, so if you, your favorite topic is not on there, I'm sorry. But I tried to give you, you know, a representative sample of, uh, of what kinds of, so just to pull a few out, um, human genetics started in 1953. Um, tissue culture, extremely, extremely important as a scientific research method, uh, was actually taught by George Guy from the medical school in our Department of Pathobiology. Um, radiation control in 1959. Uh, we have a couple of environmental toxicologists with us. Uh, so 
Um, Anna Bacher founded that division in environmental medicine in 1963. Um, the picture here is, this is George Comstock. Um, I didn't, I, I hesitated to, to create a best courses of all time list because that might hurt some people's feelings, but if you did make such a list, George Comstock's uh, tuber epidemiology of tuberculosis control would absolutely be on it. It was definitely one of the best courses ever taught at the school. So here he is with, I think this he's actually here with the preventive medicine residents. I do want to stop here and point out a couple of differences about the, the school building and facilities and environment. Um, and this picture gives me a good chance to do that. Um, this is the the edge of the building, which only took up less than half the block on, uh, on the block that we're sitting on uh, when this picture was taken in around the late 70s, I think. So um, this, for those of you in external affairs, they are sitting pretty much where, right where our offices are, <laughs> right across from the Welch Library. So, Students could go out and, and sit outside, and there were lots of trees and benches, and people ate their lunch. And believe it or not, there was a giant parking lot here, and you could just park your car in a parking lot. What a concept. Anna Bacher did point out, though, uh, she wrote Ernest Stebbins, the dean, and said that now the uh, you need to implement some injury control here because you know when you try to turn onto Orlean Street, you know there's just not enough room and visibility. You know, so anyway, she was uh, worried about everyone being safe. But so injury prevention, first course in injury prevention is Sue Baker in 1972, and then we have courses beginning on HIV/AIDS in 1985. So I can't believe. How, how time has flown, so I want to try to get through some more things, uh, but still have time to, to talk afterwards. Um, so a major transition in the history of the curriculum of the school is the science requirement. So this is the description of sanitary bacteriology from the 1920 course catalog, and the chair of bacteriology then was a man named William W. Ford. And just to give you an idea of what you would get to learn if you were in his class, oops, sorry, uh, it says, gives students a fundamental training in bacteriology and sanitary bacteriology. Um, and you use uh, pathogenic, and you study the bacteria. Um, you examine the water, milk, sewage. Oh, you examine sewage, great. Um, and his method of teaching bacteriology, he said that give students a stool, that is a stool sample, and he will learn bacteriology. So this course, when the specialized MPH came online, the psychiatrists were going, no way. We've got to do that. We're psychiatrists. We don't want to do that. That's not relevant to what we're doing. So there was a tension. As the degree of specialization increased, there's a lot of debate about you know, how much specialized courses versus core courses should there be. And a lot of people started arguing with that very strong scientific tradition of how everyone uh, examines stuff in microscopes. The psychiatrist said, you know, yeah, we can, you know, we can talk about like what Freud would say about your anal retentiveness, but uh, we really don't want to deal with the actual thing. Um, so in 1957, um, it's really a watershed for curriculum development at the school. Uh, a group of kind of renegade faculty, uh, uh, Paul Lemkow in mental hygiene, Fred Bang in pathobiology, uh, and several other faculty create this new course called Pathobiology, Biology of Populations. And a lot of people that I've interviewed have actually taken this course, and I don't know exactly when it stops being the science requirement, but it, it goes on for several dec decades. So as I was saying earlier with vertebrate ecology, this course tries to look at 
parasites. It's, it's kind of a version of cell to society. It looks at parasites, it looks at genetics, it looks at population dynamics in both human populations and animal populations. Uh, why do populations grow or migrate or get sick and die and shrink? Um, and it also looks at the inter interaction of populations with infectious disease. So you do everything from look at stuff in a microscope to um, one of the labs in this class, which I thought would be really cool, is you looked at children's drawings and learned techniques of evaluating whether they were mentally ill from their drawings, okay? Because you were learning about growth and development because, of course, individuals in a population are growing and developing and, and that affects the population dynamics. So it's a really cool idea. I think that it was kind of a catch-all course in some ways, and maybe it was difficult to kind of get a, a, um, a strong theme throughout the course, but this became the new science requirement, and it really created uh, a lot of backlash. The basic science departments did not like their, you know, strong basic science course in my microbiology. They did not like that being replaced by this course. So in 1957, um, the basic scientists are kind of on the warpath, and they say, MPH, it's like messing everything up. Let's get rid of it. Uh, they propose, at a time that the school is in financial straits, they propose to get rid of one of the main tuition generators <laughs> in the school. So guess what? It doesn't really go anywhere. But there is the threat of eliminating the MPH and focusing on um, two-year doctoral degrees and, and focusing on MDs. And the reason they talk about doing that is the, the scope of the curriculum in both public health and medicine is getting so broad and so big, there's really, and, and we have this problem today, uh, can you really teach someone everything they need to know in a year? Um, so that's one of the reasons why they were talking about just going to the, the DRPH. But, as I said, that didn't happen. Now, a lot of those basic science faculty, including Thomas Turner, who led the report, that acronym is the Committee for the, uh, the Committee to Review the Educational Objectives of the School. Um, so there's a lot of uh, hand wringing and soul searching, but what comes out of that committee is that the MPH endures and uh, in fact, dramatically grows. And I do see, unfortunately, that we're kind of running out of time. So uh, international students really surge in the 60s and 70s. This is the countries that we are giving the most foreign aid to. You can see a Vietnam and others in Southeast Asia and India are, are more than half. So you can see also that um, you know, we have a lot of Asian students in our International Health Planners course. So during the Vietnam War, we have a lot of both um, military and health officers with USAID who are going to Vietnam to help with the um, what Lyndon Johnson called the other war, um, the humanitarian aid side in Vietnam. And then also we have um, South Vietnamese nationals coming to the school to also uh, learn these principles. So um, I thought Betty Addison might come to this, and I see she's not here. That's too bad. But um, a very important turning point in the uh, in student services is actually affirmative action. So through most of the 70s, there you would, if you were a student here, you would get help from the department secretary and maybe some of the staff were assigned you know, on the admissions committee and kind of could help you get through your degree program, but there was not a standard um, resources, there was not a, an office of, of student services where you could go and get help uh, with your problems. There was, however, a neat group called WISH, the Women in the School of Hygiene. I think Women Improving School, can you? Can, Alan, do you remember what WISH stood for? 
Anybody? Anyway, but it was mostly faculty wives uh, who got together and they would do really nice things for the students. Um, they would take them grocery shopping. They would decorate the school. They would um, buy new furniture in the lounge. And uh, so there, as far as student life goes, there was always an international dinner every year and all the people from different countries around the world would bring dishes from their native country and that was like kind of the height of the social season. Um, what, you know, just briefly, what affirmative action and really uh, the pressure of federal agencies, since we were getting so much federal funding, um, federal law uh, dictated that we needed to increase our efforts to recruit and retrain minorities in both the student body and on the faculty. Um, and we, we did so. And in 1974, uh, the group on the Minority Recruitment Committee uh, gave out a, a student survey to ask um, what kinds of initiatives or programs could we do uh, to focus attention on the delivery of health care to minorities and the disadvantaged. I think their responses um, have a lot to tell us today because having been involved in accreditation recently, these issues are very much still on the table. Um, some students said uh, we shouldn't treat it as, as a special topic. Um, we should just treat it you know, as one of many areas of public health and we don't want to talk specifically about race. Uh, other people said that um, uh, we should seriously consider, and I, I love this quote, it's time the ivory tower medical care came down to the grassroots faced by the world's population, be it India, Pakistan, or Appalachia. So I thought that was an interesting perspective. So what happens when uh, D.A. Henderson becomes dean in 1977, he makes it a priority to create a full-time Associate Dean of Student Affairs, Edward Rulehack, who also was the first African-American dean appointed in the whole university and at the school. Um, and uh, he is assisted by Betty Addison, who is still here uh, at the school, and they create a career development network, the first course evaluations. Um, and even our MPH student orientation was originally created as a student orientation to help minority students adjust to the school. And then we realized, that's a great idea. Let's do it for everybody. Uh, so that's one of my takeaways, is that, um, you know, so as I've said, the MPH wasn't originally a priority, but for the reasons I've talked about, um, the Social Security Act and uh, accreditation becoming uh, a national movement in public health, the MPH comes to the forefront, and in 1939, we changed the name of our certificate to a master's in public health. Uh, and this really uh, changes the fundamental character of the school to become more practice-oriented, uh, more to care more about teaching, um, and uh, to, to be more balanced in the, the practice and teaching versus research aspects of the school. Um, we have definitely dramatically expanded the professional backgrounds of the school and also the diversity of the curriculum in, in numerous disciplines. Um, we no longer study stool samples in bacteriology, at least not as far as I know, perhaps. Uh, any, anybody in environmental health know <laughs> anybody does that anymore? I don't, I don't think so, but pardon? Okay, in parasitology, all right, that would make sense, yes. So, um, and finally, you know, I do think that affirmative action was part of what sparked, you know, improvements for the entire school that have benefited everyone across the board. So that is my talk, and thank you very much. Any questions, or you want to go back to any slides? Yes?
bit more practical. Well, I want to emphasize that we didn't move away from science. We just diversified and added public health administration uh, as a component of both the research and the curriculum. So to give you an idea, um, the basic science departments uh, dominated the school early on in both the degrees awarded um, and the number of faculty in, in each department. But uh, public health administration in 1932 had like two or three people in it. And by 1960, it's by far the largest department in the school. Um, and it creates all of this, this trend of specialization that I was talking about. It creates um, the Department of International Health, the Department of Maternal and Child Health, um, the Department of Behavioral Sciences. I mean, it, there's all these spin-offs from public health administration because public health during the 50s is really moving into um, overseeing the administration of government-funded health services. And in 1965, Medicare and Medicaid are passed. But even before then, the states are very much expanding uh, state-funded health services. So that becomes a key component of public health in a way that it hadn't been before. And that's a major reason why the teaching and the degree programs really um, flourish and expand in public health administration. Is that, um, anyone else? Well, thank you very much uh, for coming. I, I really appreciate it.